Hi, my name is India Oxenberg. I survived the Nexium cult for seven years, and I am a victim of sexual violence. So Nexium was started by Keith Ranieri, who is a self-proclaimed genius and entrepreneur who has a track record of many failed businesses and also disgruntled employees and rape victims. He is now in prison for 120 years on, you know, a number of charges. I was very close with my mother because it was just her and I for the first seven years of my life. I grew up in Beverly Hills, Malibu. I went to high school. I was graduating when I was 18 and I ended up going to school in Boston. I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do, but I gave college a shot and I decided I didn't like it at the time. And I ended up going back to LA, but I didn't have any direction. And so I ended up actually at an intro presentation for Nexium. And my mom and I ended up going together. And that was when I was 19 and I had just come back from this year in college. And so I was looking for direction and I was looking for structure and I was looking for something to kind of like guide me to my next step. And it was just kind of like right place, right time in my mind, because everything that they were saying in the intro presentation was things that I thought that I needed. <laughs> so at that point in the presentation, they instructed us to put down deposits, to hold our places. I mean, another red flag, like any kind of hard sales pitch, you should really just like take a step back. After the intro presentation, I was really taken by the pitch that they had and my, my mom, who had come to the intro with me was a little less enthralled. But I turned to her during that time and I was like, mom, I wanna do this and I wanna do this with you. This is for me. I literally said that, this is for me. And my mom being in utter shock because I was so indecisive at the time, my 19 year old self was jumping all over the place. She was like, okay, like if you're this decisive, like." Maybe we should do this. I was like, well, it could be a bonding experience for us. Like I literally was looking at it from that perspective. I was gonna go in, take five days, like a five day retreat with my mom, you know, get in, get out. Little did I know that that was gonna be like the beginning to the biggest decision of my whole freaking life. At the time, we're putting down a deposit. Like it just like didn't, it just seemed so innocent. Like we just could not see that the red flags were really right in front of us. And we ended up taking a five day course together in Venice. The truth is I freaking love to learn and I love to talk and I love to you know, explore and get curious about different topics. And that was the entire five days. We're just us exploring different topics on the surface. But what I didn't realize was what they were doing underneath, which was the indoctrination and the coercive aspect, which is, you know, the first steps to brainwashing, which is changing somebody's definitions about words that they feel about certain things, which at the time also seemed very innocent because it was just like, oh, we're just exploring ideas. My mom wasn't having it. After the five day class, I didn't think about doing more until they started to push that there were there was more. That was the, the sales approach was get them on this big high so that they're like loving life and that they're feeling good and then throw them the rest of the programs and see what sticks and see what we can pressure people into buying. I think what I think what really was sticking for me was I was feeling like I was a part of something bigger than me. Like I was feeling like the group of people that I had just met and just done this like kind of intense five day experience with were peers almost. And it was this closeness that they had facilitated that made my guard drop. And also just made me think like, well, maybe this is right for me. Like these people all seem to like me. They're encouraging me to do more. They see something in me. I mean, like all of this now is a red flag to me because people who, you know, are super charismatic, and you know all over you and like praising you can often be manipulative people so then I ended up signing up for more courses because I thought that was going to be my way to acquire the skills that they were saying I, I was going to acquire and even at the time they were selling it as like this is a practical MBA and I was like well I mean, I need executive skills. So if that's what you're saying this is, then I'll keep going. And then they started to put a lot of pressure on me to become a coach. The last effing thing I wanna do is be a coach. I was like, no. But 
they kept telling me like, no, you don't understand. The coaching path is the way that you're going to build the skills and the tools that you need to be an entrepreneur. You must be a good follower in order to be a good leader. And they had all of these like, you know, taglines, which actually are logical. Of course, you have to be a good follower to be a good leader. But I didn't know that I was being led to be a follower of a sociopath. Manipulative people are not original. They are predictable and they're very good at identifying other people's vulnerabilities. During during that time, distance was building between me and my family and all my friends, to be honest. Like the, the only friends that I had at that time were people within Nexium, And so I was drifting away from my family and, and I was becoming noticeably different to them. Like I was less, myself. The day-to-day -day that I had while living in California was really focused on me doing work for Nexium for free, like indentured servitude. And then that was the first like five years of Nexium where I was kind of living two different lives where I was involved in all things related to Nexium. They were trying to have me recruit all the time, which was really a lot of pressure on me. And then when I was recruited into DOS by Allison Mack, which was the cult within the cult that was much more nefarious. Allison Mack started recruiting me into DOS uh, around 2015. And what she pitched me was like executive customized coaching for women with women. And she also said that it was going to push me past my comfort zone and that it was going to give me the extra push that I needed for my growth. And at the time, I was in a very vulnerable place. You know, I had been in Nexium for about five years. I hadn't grown and I was thinking that that was entirely my fault, not that they were keeping me there for a reason. So when she approached me, I was really open to her suggestions and she said, you know, I've joined this group. It's really secret. It's just women coaching women. I think it would really help you. DOS itself was different for everyone. My specific group of women that I was with were particularly targeted by Keith because we were on the younger side. And we also were like, we looked the way that he was attracted to women. And we didn't know that he was involved in this group whatsoever. We thought that this was an exclusively female oriented group. So when we started to get assignments that required us to, for instance, me, I was required to seduce Keith and, you know, the series seduced really goes deep into just like the psychology of what that was like for me at the time and what I was being told versus what was actually happening behind the scenes, which was that Keith was orchestrating all of this and instructing Allison to do um, pretty aggressive things with us, like including penances, calorie restriction, extensive uh, dieting, and also sleep deprivation, physical challenges, like, you know, having to take cold showers, walk in the snow, you, you name it, like whatever they thought that you needed in order to break you down, they would give to you as an assignment. So it's really a process of dehumanizing and also creating a broken person who is very obedient. So I had definitely met Keith prior to being enrolled into DOS. And I was always really intimidated by him because they had built him up on this pedestal of like being the smartest man in the world. And like people would wait around to ask him questions. And I thought it was weird even then because I didn't come to ESP or Nexium for Keith. Like I came for myself. It just happened to be that they were obsessed with this guy. And my mind actually started to change over the years and my feelings about him started to change because of the group think. So I had met him a couple of times. I didn't like him that much. I didn't feel very comfortable around him, but I thought that that was my own problem. So when I did eventually start to actively have to reach out to him because of the assignment that I was given from Allison, I felt really weird. And I was like, ugh. I don't want this guy to think that I'm interested in him because it also, he, he was like the superior. And so it was a forced, unorganic intimacy that also led into, you know, repeated sexual assaults that I was being told at the time were not 
sexual. That's like the beginning of a lot of gaslighting around, you know, sexual violence and, and rape. And like how we were not allowed to even communicate with anybody what happened when we were with Keith. At the time when I was in DOS, I felt like I was living a double life, even within Nexium, because nobody within Nexium even knew DOS existed. So we had to operate in a whole world of secrecy and lies, and it was so hard. <laughs> the inner circle of DOS was really tight. It was it started with seven women, and then from that seven, it expanded to about a hundred very quickly. And yes, it was all women because that's who Keith preyed upon. And this was really for his own satisfaction and greed. DOS got progressively worse as they started to build a curriculum around us. So it was kind of like a human science experiment where they were practicing different protocols and practices on the individuals who are within it, specifically my group of women whether it was food deprivation or sleep deprivation, and also just kind of like restriction, restrictions of, of all pleasure. And then I guess the apex of when it really got bad was when they started branding women. And the branding was something that was also something we had no choice to do. Basically, we were instructed to get branded at, at Alice and Mac's house. And it was incredibly scary and we didn't have a choice to say no. So I was lay I was laying down on a um, massage table and then we had uh, the other women who are in my group in the room. And then it took about like a little over 30 minutes. It, was, it took a long time because they had to go over and over and over on the skin. It was done with a cauterizing pen. There were no numbing cream, no anesthesia, no nothing. Like we literally just had to grin and bear it. And, and like that scar took months to heal and it was done on our hip which is a very like sensitive kind of nerve ending area of the body and we were told at the time that the symbol that we were getting branded with was the symbol of the elements when in reality what we learned much later was that it was actually Keith Raniere's initials. This is a particular strategy that a lot of groups or even pimps do with prostitutes where it's like you brand them, you mark them. It's it's a process of ownership. It's dehumanizing. It's incredibly painful. It gets you into a dissociated state. It's all strategy. It's all thought about. It's all manipulation. And it's all in order to take you to the next level. And that is when my mom actually entered the picture. And she heard from Nexium people who had left the group that something bad was going on in Nexium. And it was because of the branding that people started to leave. The information about DOS and the branding leaked into the community and then started to leak into the mainstream media. And that's when my mom really started to push all of the news about Nexium and the horrible things that the cult was doing. I was so under their influence and I was so brainwashed. I wanted to believe so badly that what we were doing was good that they convinced me and I convinced myself. And so it took extensive amounts of deprogramming and all sorts of different therapies in order to get my mind back to my own mind again. It was so hard to even question because questioning was not an option. If you questioned, you would get punished. So how many times do you have to learn that before you just stop questioning? What I didn't know at the time was I didn't know about grooming. I didn't know about indoctrination and how palpable it is and how it can affect your brain. I didn't know about trauma. I didn't know about predatory alienation. All these things that like once you know this information, you're so much more well equipped because you're able to identify things even when the negative press was coming out about Nexium and the cult, I was still defending the cult. I was still feeling very loyal to the cult because they had turned me against my own mom and they had made my mother like enemy number one. So they were putting me up against my own mother, which felt horrible. There was periods of time where I didn't even talk to my mom for like nine months. That is not the type of relationship that I have with my mother, but I wasn't ready to leave. And I like, I, I dug my heels in and I've talked to my mom about this a lot, obviously, since then. And she was like, it was like we were speaking two different languages. I ended up leaving Albany and going to New York City when 
everyone started leaving Albany and dispersing and I was still there and I was like, what am I still doing here? So I was like, I think I'm going to go look for work in New York to see if I can get hired. But even at that point, media stuff was still coming out about me, like calling me a sex slave, calling me a branded sex slave. And so when I went to go and apply to jobs, I didn't get a lot of responses. One, because I had been in a cult for seven years and my resume was jack shit at that time. And two, because every time they would Google me, they would be like, uh, no. And, and I remember thinking, I wonder if I'm going to have to like run away to the mountains and change my name and like completely, you know, start a new life because I just didn't see how I was going to recover from it at the time. It was humiliating. It was like, Having everyone in your underwear drawer looking at like the biggest mistake of your life and they all have opinions about it and they all think they know the real truth about it. So I was feeling a lot of despair and then finally I got a job managing a cafe in the East Village. I just didn't want to think about the shit show that was my life at that time because everything that I had ever known, including my family life and my public image, was just imploding. After nine months of not speaking to my mom, I started to slowly crawl out of, you know, this iceberg that was around me and start to communicate with my mom with a mediator at first. It took me months of therapy and deprogramming and also nine months of working with the FBI to really like unpack the fullness of this trauma that I had experienced for the past seven years. I'm so lucky that I had the support system that I had in order to build the strength that I needed to even confront my perpetrator. And I, re I read my victim impact statement at his sentencing where he got 120 years. My life now is actually like really spectacular. I mean, I, Oftentimes I, I stop and I'm like, I can't believe that this is my life. With all of the beauty that I have in my life that doesn't eradicate the dark, challenging days either. And like, I don't like to sugarcoat it for people because like I said, healing is non-linear. So there are days and there are times where I'll get triggered by something, but I'm so lucky that I have the tools and the support system in order to ride that wave rather than be consumed by that pain. My former self, it's almost like I'm looking at a whole different person that, back in Nexium. If you're in a cult now and you're feeling like controlled or muted or like you don't have a choice, try and find someone outside of the group who you trust and be brave enough to share because that's just the first step. Our foundation, it's called the Catherine Oxenberg Foundation. And what we do is we raise money to offer therapy to people who are victims of sexual violence and PTSD trauma. We also offer psychedelic assisted therapy. The reason I talk about this stuff is not to instill fear in people. It's not to make your life scarier or more intimidating, but really just to use my story as a cautionary tale, like have it help you to not make the mistakes that I've made in my life. And I, and I hope that anyone who watches this takes a little nugget with them and, you know, helps someone they love avoid a situation like this. Thank you so much for hearing my story. My name is India Oxenberg. And if there are any other resources that you're looking for, you can find me on Instagram. Um, I am also on the National Advisory Board for RAIN, which is the premier anonymous hotline for anyone who's experiencing sexual violence. So please check them out if you need it. If you are triggered by anything in our conversation, they're a great resource.